Okay, fantastic. So we are recording and we're live streaming on YouTube. Welcome everybody to this uh, to this very special webinar as part of the OGP Open Response Open Recovery Digital Forum, uh, looking at how we keep governments open in time in the during the coronavirus pandemic, but also how we uh, try to ensure that to the extent that we can, we take the opportunity to not only defend, but to expand open government during the response phase. This particular webinar tonight for the next one and a half hours is on keeping information and data out of lockdown. And we are privileged to have a really excellent group of specialist speakers with us. Um, so I'm just going to run through and introduce them. And then I am going to uh, just say a couple of words of introduction, and then we'll get straight into the substantive, um, substantive presentations. Um, so first we have, I hope we have, I haven't actually seen her yet. Yes, Anna Maria Musa, uh, joining us from Zagreb, I think, the former information commissioner of Croatia. And just say hi. Hi. Hello. Uh, hello, Anna Maria. Great that you could join. And then uh, we're going to uh, Toby Mendel uh, in Halifax, Nova Scotia, in Canada. Welcome, Toby. Uh, do we have Eduardo Bertoni? Not yet. Okay, although I see some of his colleagues are on the call, so probably he's about to join. Um, Philip Thigo uh, from the government of Kenya. Thank you for having me. Hi, Philip. Where are you? Are you in uh, Nairobi? I'm in Nairobi, yes. Yes, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and now, I guess, from right around the other side of the world, Paul Stone from Stats, New Zealand. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's rather funny because at eight o'clock this morning, European time, I was on a, a conference call with two of your colleagues who are about to go to bed. So you've taken over from them. <laughs> That's great. Um, uh, Augustin Frisera from Democracia in Red. Hello, how are you? Hi, Augustine. Welcome. Where are you from? Calling, coming in from? Buenos Aires. I'm speaking. You're in Buenos Aires. Fantastic. And we should have Anya Calderon from the Open Data Charter joining from London. Anya, you are there. I'm here. Hi, everyone. It's nice Fantastic. to meet you. Fantastic. Great. So, uh, oh, and Eduardo is there as Agostina. I see. And we can't hear you, Eduardo. You're muted. And I don't know if I can, um, uh, can I unmute you? Try now. Okay. Ah, yes. Now, me? yes. Okay, I will change. I will change my mic and I, I will come back. I am here and I was here when you introduced me. So. You were fine. I'm sorry. I apologize. I didn't see you. No problem. No problem. I, I will change the mic. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. Fantastic. So we've got uh, a really excellent panel. I also will mention, um, coming in his personal capacity, um, Fernando Florindo Rijon from the Council of the EU, who's been working. We'll tell us a bit later about how he's been working to keep access to information requests flowing um, uh, during the, the lockdown. Uh, welcome also, Fernando. Hello, good evening to all of you. Good evening. I would ask all the speakers to put yourselves on mute when you're not speaking. Uh, a couple of housekeeping rules. Um, Megan may have said them at the beginning, but I'll repeat them. We do have interpretation into Spanish and French. Uh, so that you can listen in, in one language uh, or you can skip between languages if you do that. For our speakers, uh, it's really important to note that when you speak, you must be, have your settings set to the same language as you speak in. So if you will speak in Spanish, have it set to Spanish. If you will speak in French, have it set to French and English to English. Otherwise, we mess up the interpretation. Um, I'd like right from the outset to say thank you so much to Megan Wallace and Bianca Nelson and everyone at the Open Government Partnership Support Unit 
for getting this set up and the whole Open Response, Open Recovery Week. Uh, I didn't introduce myself, I realize. I'm Helen Derbyshire, for those who don't know me, hi. Um, it's fantastic to see so many people from all around the world, literally all around the world, joining this very important discussion. I'm here um, as someone who works on the right of access to information, running the organization Access Info Europe, based in Madrid, from where I'm joining you in the early evening in Madrid. I'm missing my evening stroll. Um, and uh, I'm also here in my capacity as one of the uh, civil, 11 civil society members of the Open Government Partnership Steering Committee. And just to recall, uh, for those of you who don't know, the Steering Committee of the Open Government Partnership comprises 11 civil society representatives and 11 governments. Um, and we work together to oversee and help promote and advance the work that the Open Government Partnership is doing. And this, uh, this event is taking place in what would have been originally Open Government Week around the world. Um, so it's a substitute and it's also, we, we changed all the plans for Open Government Week because of the particular context in which the world finds itself right now. Um, uh, the, the objective of this call, of this webinar, is to discuss the challenges that we face uh, in maintaining open government as many countries have gone into states of emergency, as people are in lockdown or confinement, quarantine, whatever you call it, and people are working from home. So it's very important to discuss the challenges that that poses, both for responding to requests for information and publishing data and information proactively, but we also want to focus very much on the opportunities, on how we can ensure that in this moment we do not only defend the right of access to information, but we also actually take steps to lay the groundwork to advance, uh, to increase levels of responses to requests, to increase the in to improve the infrastructure and to increase uh, levels of publication of data in uh, open formats. I think that one thing that has happened in these last few weeks, which sometimes seem like much more than a few weeks, but in the last couple of months, is we've seen the amazing appetite that the public has for information and also the challenges of getting correct, accurate, comprehensive, complete information data to the public in a timely fashion. Um, it's been a huge challenge for governments. Um, it's perhaps laid bare some of the problems we have with uh, data collection, with lack of disaggregated data, with lack of systems for collecting information uh, and, and getting it rapidly uh, online and disseminating it through other means so that it reaches all sectors of the population. Um, so I think that we've exposed some of the challenges which we as a professional community knew that we already had, and I'd like to address that, but also how can we propose solutions which will ensure that as we move forward, coming out of this pandemic, which will take a while, I think, and, and moving on from it, hopefully in the not too distant future, how do we ensure that we don't forget the lessons that we've learned and that we uh, set in place mechanisms which allow us to increase levels of openness. Um, so with that, those words of introduction, I'd like to turn to our first, we've, we've divided them into blocks of, of, of speakers. We'll have two speakers in the first block, which will be about 20 minutes. Uh, short interventions, I've asked for three or four minutes, let's see what we can do. And it's to the extent you can. And then we'll have time for questions and answers. And I ask everyone, um, I might need some guidance on this, Megan. They're going to, the questions will be put into the into the chat. Is that right? Yep. Questions should go into the chat. Okay. So I'm trying to monitor the chat while I'm listening to. You. It's a bit of uh, juggling here, but I'll do what I can. Um, I've got colleagues on the line helping as well. Um, so if you have a question, specific, be specific and clear. Thank you very much. Megan is going to help with the questions. Wonderful. So. Uh, let me go uh, first, as I've got it here, to Eduardo Bertoni, Director of the uh, Information Agency in Argentina, 
Welcome, Eduardo. And could you tell us a little bit about um, what, you, what you've needed to do in these first weeks of the, uh, of the state of emergency there in Argentina and your vision on things? Thank you. Thank you very much, Helen. Can you hear me now? I changed the mic. Yes? OK, perfect. Uh, thanks again for the invitation. Uh, and thanks, Helen, for, for your introduction. Uh, I was expecting you to introduce me in Spanish. I know that your Spanish is perfect. Lo siento. No, no, I'm just kidding. I, I'm just kidding. Uh, and I will move to, to talk in Spanish. I don't know if I have something specific to do. If I start speaking Spanish. You should make sure at the bottom of your screen that the little icon for interpretation is set to Spanish. So move your mouse over the bottom of the screen. Look for the it, little I, globe. I don't have anything in the bottom. I have something. You have a globe the, that says uh, Spanish. I am using a, an iPad. I'm not sure if I have that bottom. Um, Megan, can we help there switch Eduardo to Spanish? I'm sorry about that. I can do the presentation in English, but since I am speaking in an, my official position, I prefer to speak in Spanish, as always I do. If it is not possible... Eduardo, I I, yes. do you have like three dots? Yes, I have. And if you click there, can you see the interpretation? Language button? interpretation, yes, I put in Spanish. So is that all right? Can you hear me in English? All right, thank you so much. I will try to go very quickly because I do not have a lot of time. So I would like to share with you, well, first and foremost, to give you some words about the challenges and the immediate needs that we have. And I'm going to be very, very brief so that I can just really raise more discussion and to continue also this debate with our panel members. So. I would like to say that the main challenges, well, are summarized into three challenges. The first one is going to be entitled, do not stop the flow. And the second one is being realistic and also ensuring that fundamental rights are preserved. And the third challenge is not really putting a lot of stuff into the shadow. When I say do not stop the flow, what do I mean? Well, are facing a situation where we have a lot of governments for, well, for many, many reasons, a lot of governments have had to put the population into these lockdown, public officials, for instance, and of course that has resulted in some processes, administrative processes, for instance, that are part of this federal government to be suspended, right? So this suspension of services leads person not to be able to exercise their rights so right now we are talking again about fundamental rights, such as the access to information. So the fact that we have suspended certain processes that could result immediately into a direct suspension of a fundamental right. So do not stop the flow, do not stop this workflow. What do I mean with this? Well, that we wanted to find a very specific way to address this in spite of the fact of having all of these administrative processes to file any sort of petition before the authorities in the Republic of Argentina, well, I just wanted to let you know that we are not suspending or seizing these processes to continue. We can just start filing claims, for instance. That's how we decided to go in this way. We have decided not to stop our workflow. The second one, again, is to be realistic again. We need to ensure that these fundamental rights are preserved. What do I mean with this? Well, this is related to the previous point that I already mentioned. We are still processing a lot of this information requests, and we know that these requests for information need to be fulfilled within the terms specified by law, because we need to answer to our citizens in the shortest term possible. This is according to the international standards. However, we, of course, need to be realistic as well. At times, we know that certain pieces of information are available at an office that may be locked down because of this outbreak. And for that reason, we may not be able to have access to that information within the time frame that has been specified by law. So to us in the agency, that's a huge challenge, of course, because we would like to stick to these terms. However, we need to remain realistic. But again, 
if we are part of the public administration and then we can just prove that that information is found at an office that is locked down and that the staff cannot have access to that office such as the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Well, the building was locked down because of this outbreak. So what we needed to do was to be really pragmatic for us to be able to, of course, allow certain exceptions for that reason. Again, I am just telling you and I'm just raising this fact of being realistic. And the last point is not to put the crystal house into the shade. What do I mean with this? I mean that our transparency, which I like to call this crystal box so that everyone can look inside our house, inside our offices with more active information provided by the state and to have more public information available, of course, le uh, less requests for information. So the more transparent it is, the more we have to really be protective of this crystal box. So again, in this open government context, we need to know that a lot of the updates that are required for this proactive information that is made available by the government, well, in this cases, we may find certain delays when it comes to just keeping all of this information current. And of course, this crystal box may be left into the shade, like I mentioned at first, we may not be actively, actively transparent or providing with proper and enough information on time because of this outbreak, because of this health emergency. So again, we need to start controlling all of this so that in the event this were to happen, just by exception, we need to see how we work with this at this public access to information department in Argentina. We need to control all of this information because we know that, of course, we need to be able to make available a lot of this information through the websites. So, well, these are the three main points that I wanted to share with you. Of course, I have many more things to say, but that's all I have to say for the moment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eduardo, for just outlining all of this so clearly. Thank you so much for addressing these challenges. Okay, so now I'm going to uh, switch to uh, Ana Maria Musa, former Information Commissioner of Croatia, um, with whom I've had the pleasure to work in various countries uh, around, uh, around that region. Um, uh, who's also, I know, has joined a, a previous call that we have for some of the RTI experts in Europe and has been doing a lot of thinking on, on this issue. So, Anna Maria, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Helen. So, um, my, uh, uh, my part in this uh, today's meeting, which I really am glad to participate in, is uh, to say what I think about uh, <laughs> the current challenges uh, uh, on transparency. Uh, and my opinion is basically based on my uh, personal experience as information commissioner, but also uh, from some discussions I had with the commissioners and the employees of the commissioner's offices in the region. So basically, um, most of, I mean, many things were said already. So, but I will just uh, uh, focus on two issues here. So one, one thing uh, I want to say is that uh, this crisis has put a tremendous pressure on transparency. Uh, and on, in two ways. So one way is this operational way. So the way the public administrations are and governments are responding. So uh, as we were all, all uh, are aware, so there are uh, 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 delays. There, there is a problem of capacity of public organizations, basically because not all people are employed the same uh, are not physically in the offices at this time. Uh, and of course, records management has proven to be very weak in some, in some countries, in some organizations, and not yet up to the level you would expect in 21st century. So all these issues can affect the, the, uh, um, the, the speed, basically, in which uh, uh, public is uh, receiving the information, which now is very crucial. Uh, the second thing here is the uh, general culture of transparency of, uh, in different countries. Uh, so I would say that developing countries uh, young democracies are especially vulnerable on this, in this crisis. Um, and of course, in this operational uh, part, uh, I would also want to uh, emphasize that uh, 
uh, that one of the crucial factor is uh, what is the thing that uh, uh, open data is still not present, is not a standard in all public administrations. So we have seen now that it is precisely the open data that uh, we need in times of crisis, because it allows us uh, comparisons, it allows us, an, when I'm saying us, I mean public, the public, any part of the public, but also the, the, the for those who make decisions. So what we've seen now is the, the pressure from civil society organizations, from media, from academia, and all these uh, uh, subsectors, I would say, are now, are, are now uh, cooperating, cooperating as much, uh, I mean, they're never cooperated so much as, as now. Uh, I can say that from academia right now. So we have many groups discussing many issues. So everything is online. We don't have to travel anywhere. We, we can all be in, in the topic uh, the, uh, all the time. The same is, uh, is uh, in business. I've heard that in many businesses, there's also a kind of cooperation to put pressure on government, to disclose information, to say, when you, will you open the borders? When will we be able to work? So there is a, a demand for information, which is the greatest, I mean, ever, I would say. Uh, and at the same time, there's a there's a response in in in, in government which can be, uh, which can be basically, which is not always uh, uh, always uh, appropriate. So one thing is that maybe we are now focused uh, a lot on health health information or information which is connected to this crisis. We might lose focus in, uh, from this. We, we might basically uh, forget that there are many other issues going on in public administrations. And as civil society organizations and academia, we still have to uh, 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 demand uh, uh, transparency in I don't know, public procurement, uh, organizational employment in public sector. Uh, anything that is really always uh, in, in the focus of those who, uh, who are uh, perceived as watchdogs of the, of the public sector. Uh, but the th second thing is here, and, and it has been uh, mentioned so far, uh, is that um, given the fact that this crisis has uh, allowed government governments to restrict freedoms and uh, citizens' rights, it is very, very dangerous now to allow governments to restrict uh, the access to information on the basis of um, uh, on the basis of uh, extraordinary. Uh, circumstances. So, in my opinion, it is really in the rare and very, very specific cases when these restrictions would be uh, acceptable. So, it cannot be uh, basically just to be sure that uh, public is not taking some information in the wrong way or something like that. So, the thing is that uh, the, the 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 level of transparency and the communication has to be uh, not not maintained, but even uh, improved in compared to pre-COVID times, I would say. So basically, uh, um, constitutions in many countries uh, 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 prevent governments to just, you know, easily uh, take a carte blanche and, you know, do whatever they want without a right. So basically, they have to, uh, uh, they have to be aware that uh, there, there's only really uh, um, a, a small portion, a small possibility of uh, to restrict the uh, rights and freedoms of of citizens. So in that way, I would say that uh, uh, the hide and hide and seek game is not is not something we can tolerate right now, especially right now. So uh, I would say that uh, to finish, I would just say that um, the cooperation of civil society organization demands for information, especially the information which might not be see, might not seem to be such of such importance right now. Uh, and um, the uh, work of independent authorities from commissioners, ombudsmen, ombudspersons, and uh, uh, media, of course, uh, is something we, we really uh, need to uh, uh, put focus on and, uh, and maintain the, um, the, the flow of information or even improve it. Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed, Anna Maria. Um, and you've emphasized some really important points there, um, including the, 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 the threats to uh, the advances that have been made in recent years in relatively young democracies um, at this time, whether the culture of transparency is not so deeply implanted perhaps, and there is a temptation to roll back on it. Um, and another point that you made that I think is very important is the nexus that we're seeing right now between the right of access to information and the proactive publication of 
data and and documents as well. It's something I think many of us and many of the, the speakers on this call probably already um, recognized, but there's sometimes been a little bit of an artificial divide between the access to information community on the one hand and the open data community on the other hand. That's why we very much wanted to do this call with the open data charter. It's great to have Annie. I see Annie is smiling as I speak. Um, so uh, the, to the extent that there is a very high demand for information, the real response to this demand needs to be not by answering single information requests, but by ensuring that that information is made public uh, proactively. Um, and also, yes, the cooperation, well, this is part of the cooperation and, and that is very important that we've been able to use the digital tools that we have to come together. And I guess one of the challenges right now is to um, really harness all that cooperation so that we get the clear messages to the governments and bring, ensuring that we bring in different sectors that are information hungry at this point, including different sectors of civil society and also the business community is uh, is really important um it's not it's about health data right now but it's about a lot of other a lot of other sectors of society are affected and need information as well okay so let's see um do we have any questions i'm slightly surprised uh, although maybe the two first two speakers were so comprehensive and clear um, I'm trying to read the last, there's comments coming in. Oh, I see a comment from Marius uh, Lucas Yunus from UNESCO there. Um, Do you see room for setting new standards aimed to support the right of access to information on the intergovernmental level? Or do you see the, the current international framework is sufficient that's a really good question marius also just to note that unesco is the body that is charged with overseeing states reporting on the sustainable development goal uh 16.10.2 indicator which is on the right of access to information so the question is are this do we need new standards or is it a question of enforcing the existing standards anna maria you're nodding so i'll go to you first Yeah, well, uh, I was nodding because I, I'm also asking myself the same question, <laughs> whether the uh, uh, whether it will lead us to new standards or but first, I mean, I personally would like to see uh, the existing standards enforced uh, when it comes to intergovernmental uh, uh, cooperation or uh, regional or international initiatives, for example, the Council of Europe uh, Convention, I don't know if it's, I mean, it's it's been 12 years, whether to actually I don't know what to say, but um, I personally was, uh, uh, I tried to put pressure on our government to, to sign the, the convention and to ratify it, but I didn't, didn't make it. I know that many colleagues have also done the same, but um, I, would, I would say that um, we all know the standards right now, but uh, what uh, uh, maybe the priorities, uh, priorities could be changed or maybe some, some, uh, uh, um, nuances could be made. For example, one thing I, that comes to my mind is the standard of uh, equal position of all requesters. Uh, now, when with media requests and NG, uh, civil society requests for really, really crucial information when it comes to health or when it comes to emergency, might be in some of case, uh, occasions considered as being a priority because it's affects all, all, I mean, the, the citizens as a whole, or the society or the community. And the other thing is uh, uh, open by default. I think that now in 21st century, especially now when we've seen both at individual level and organizational level that we can live online. I mean, I'm not that happy in general <laughs> that we are moving to virtual uh, life, but we can communicate, we can have everything online even work from home, but we never thought we could and be closed uh, for months in, in, in our apartment. So basically I would say uh, uh, prioritization when it comes to the information that affects the society as a whole or even global, global community. We've seen that some information was also 
you know, not available, but it, like, uh, which should have been available. So one thing, and second, open by default, I think that now it should be number one, number one standard. Fantastic. Thank you very much for the plug for the open by default. Um, and I think that uh, the idea that the existing standards are there, but they're not yet sufficiently um, uh, respected is something that's really important. And ensuring that instruments like the Council for those in the European region, the Council of Europe Convention on Access to Official Documents, which needs one more country to ratify it so that it comes into force, is something that we really should push at this point. I'll put that question to you, Eduardo. Uh, you've also got a supplementary question about whether the users, I guess the access to information users, have changed their behavior. Maybe I've heard reports from some countries, including from uh, everywhere from, uh, well, in, here in Spain, in Bosnia, in Chile, that there's been more requests since the uh, crisis started. So if you want to comment on that as well, very briefly, if you wouldn't mind, thank you. Eduardo, I, I think you are. I thought that you were going to unmute me. Well, first of all, talking about international standards and then the new way to use this right. First of all, I believe that the standards, according to what you were saying, Helen, international standards that we have today are robust and are sufficient. It would be good that they would be enforced. Enforced, uh, all standards, when we talk about international standards, we had to allude to which ones we are referring to, to the beginning of the maximum, the maximum disclosure or maximum access, well, or brief delays or independent authorities, non-discrimination. I don't know if it's a little bit what my colleague from Croatia has mentioned, or we are in a disagreement on this, but I do not believe that it, it doesn't matter who requests the information, because that could lead you to a certain way, maybe journalists could have more access than those that are not journalists. And then we have human rights activists that might need to have that same access. And then we can start all over again an ancient discussion that it will be a tool that was only intended for journalists. And for many years, we have all said that this is a fundamental right. International standards that we have are very robust. I do believe that UNESCO's work in making the enforcement of these standards is important and it's important to have them into account. And then I come to the question, quite frankly, so far, but even just because of delays and how our agency works, that is our control agency, so far we have not noticed a substantial change of more requests of information on a specific topic. Maybe there is. I'm not saying it does not exist, but we are not the one that received those requests for information. Those are the different ministries. So we will be getting some claims because they have not responded to that information request. So it is possible that we can do something around that maybe using the acts of access that are with topics that are more linked to the pandemic, but I cannot uh, confirm it right now here in Argentina, but it would be reasonable that I don't have empiric data in order to say that this is going on. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much indeed, Eduardo. Um, I'm going to move on to the next block to try to keep strict about the, uh, is that right? 34. No, we still have time for a couple more questions. No, we don't. We have to move on. Sorry, just checking my timekeeping. We have to move on. Um, uh, we're now going to move to the block two, which is about innovations and short-term solutions. So what can be done in the short term? Although we've already heard 
um, for example, what was done in, uh, in Argentina. And we're going to uh, start with Philip Thiegel, who's the Senior Advisor on Data and Innovation uh, at the Legislative and Intergovernmental Liaison Office in the Government of Kenya. Philip, it's great to have you on the call. I would just say from the first poll, uh, we've only had 34 of the participants vote in the first poll, but we currently only have 3% one person, <laughs> in fact, of our participants from uh, from Africa, which is uh, a little bit disappointing. A full 50% of participants are from uh, South America and 30% from Europe. So um, it's good it's good to have your perspective and I'd love to hear what you've been doing, including perhaps in response to some of the challenges, Philip, that were raised in the uh, by the first two speakers. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, I think the sort of African African lack of representation is also because it's it's 10.35 p.m. So you can imagine it's, it's kind of late. Um, so I, I, I think I, I think I've had the first speakers and, and, and maybe uh, to put this into context, um, Kenya has about 581 confirmed cases, about 173 recovered and 26 deaths. Uh, this is something that I think is, is, is put online proactively by the government. Uh, and I think in terms, of, in terms of setting the tone, the president and the minister of health actually uh, on the day on, on, on March 11, where we had our first case, actually made a, a public uh, pronouncement that uh, the fight against COVID is an all-in effort. And anybody who is a friend of Kenya or Kenyan can quickly get into into the committees that are being set up or part of the ecosystem to respond. So we've had an overwhelming kind of all-in effort by everybody. And, and, and that's for me is the first piece, is that uh, the government must be, must be very open and transparent that this is a difficult uh, pandemic. And so how do you ensure that you create a multi-stakeholder uh, ecosystem to support that? So we did that um, with a national emergency response committee that is multi-stakeholder, including civil society. We have a COVID response fund that is largely led by private sector. And so I think for me, that, that in itself, we see that as an innovation. So the whole multi-stakeholder ecosystem of it. The second thing, of course, is understanding that COVID is a location-based pandemic. So then how do you ensure that the issues of data uh, become central to that? A quick example is that we are not on a full lockdown. We are on a partial lockdown based on data. So Nairobi, which is a capital city and one of the cities, the, the coastal hubs, Mombasa, have been on a lockdown. Specific uh, suburbs today were put on a lockdown because of data and seeing those new infections. And what the government has been very good at is having uh, the president or the minister make those pronunciations, but saying why. And that's why in our case, we've really not had either public upheavals or things like that. And, and I think for me, that's, that's really the issue. So the, the kind of innovations, of course, that we've been part of is, is putting together a digital collaborative so it's been an all-in effort, whether it's the big tech companies or local innovators um, running challenges and seeing how to support or ramp up um, government capacity. But then that brings, I think, the challenge around lack of investment <laughs> over a long period of time. But also it comes at the back of, of skepticism uh, and lack of trust of government. So it doesn't matter whether you proactively release information or not. You already have a citizen that does not really trust what you say. So then it simply means that you cannot build trust overnight. So how do you ensure that um, this opportunity of COVID becomes, becomes that, that potential of, of co-creating democracy where you build trust and people can trust on the information that you, that you actually give? Um, and, and, and understandably that, and, and, uh, and I'm sure that the, the three participants from Africa would tell you that our internet is dodgy and not many people right now are online. And yet COVID has has created a technology enhanced world. So how do you ensure that you still uh, um, are proactively releasing access to information and, 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 and ensuring that data is open with weak technology systems and weak data systems? And so I think for me in our case, it's simply about how do we then rethink uh, our investments beyond the brick and mortar of roads and rails to internet infrastructure, which now for us is a right. So how does a majority of population, for example, place access to information requests when the commission or the ombudsman is also safe distancing. It means they have to put something online. So if you're not online, then for sure you cannot get a service. 
And some of these uh, access to information requests actually uh, under our life and liberty sort of uh, component of the law, which requires 48%, 48 hour responses. So then how do you, how do you, how do those MDS, I think, respond? So, so I think for me, that's, that's a challenge I see. And that's, and those are the kind of innovations we are thinking around uh, because the future will be digitally enhanced. So how do you ensure that um, government also remains that? So I think um, the, the quick takeaways that I see, uh, an example is Mzalendo, which, which is one of the civil society organizations working with parliament to ensure that parliament remains online, but overseas um, national government. And, and, and Mzalendo being that organization also ensures that the sort of online Zoom conversations are put into formats that citizens can actually engage with. So again, it simply says that you must have those mechanisms already in existence to be able to quickly recontour them and pivot them for people for COVID-19. So I think my takeaways are these ones. Countries without foundations of democracy and mechanisms, I think will have a difficult time. And maybe it's time we rethink that so that we can repurpose those mechanisms for, 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 for emergencies. The second thing I think is not about setting new institutions. How do we innovate with the existing ones? And I think for me, it's about building capabilities, but also capabilities must be hinged on how we engage citizens in issues that matter most in their lives. Uh, whether complex or not, COVID is very scientific, but how do you ensure that you make them simple so that you can implement and measure them and everybody can measure them? And I think for me, it's again an opportunity for dialogue. And that's what we are seeing uh, in Kenya. And, and for us, we're seeing that as an opportunity to, to innovate, whether it's tools and platforms, but more or less, it's really about people. And how do we ensure that we create a, an atmosphere of engagement, regardless of the challenges you have? Wonderful. Thank you very much indeed, Philip. That was extremely interesting. Um, and it's also very important that you brought in that uh, other dimension of the, we've, we've put a lot of focus on transparency here, but the other dimension, pillar of the Open Government Partnership, which is participation, engagement, co-creation. Um, and it's fantastic to hear that you're actually doing that as part of the response, that you've been able to mobilize perhaps the existing ideas that you had or the existing uh, structure for uh, citizen engagement in order to, to bring uh, diverse actors into the response. Um, uh, that, that, that's very important and it highlights the link between transparency and participation. And uh, another point that you mentioned, the evidence-based decision-making uh, as absolutely essential to trust. We've seen declining levels of trust in various surveys and polls um, really across the board in, ma in many regions of the world, in many countries over recent years. So um, getting that trust back through openness, that's definitely something that we work on at the Open Government Partnership um, and, uh, and really sharing data so that people can understand how the decisions have been taken and why. And the fact that you've been able to do that with differentiated lockdowns is, is a very interesting case study. There may be some more questions for you on that. Um, thanks. I'll move now to our next speaker in this section, uh, which is uh, Toby Mendel at the Centre for Law and Democracy in, uh, in Canada. Um, Toby, thank you very much. And just to say, giving it a plug, um, that today the Open Government Partnership launched uh, a little mini version of the Open Government Guide, um, which has had contributions from various people, including uh, Access Info Europe, the Centre for Law and Democracy, and the IFDI in Georgia. I think we've got someone from IFDI on the, on the line. So a link's been put into the chat, but given that we've got a lot going on in the chat, um, we'll make sure that you get it in a summary message afterwards. It's on the Open Government. Ah, there it is again, the guide, the most recent item in the chat. Some, some thoughts for how to uh, keep government open uh, during this crisis and in recovery. So Toby, thanks very much and over to you. Thanks very much. I, I was just saying I'm going to and then I change it. I'm going to be unmuting myself so people can actually hear me. Um, I'm going to be very practical in my points, uh, sort of very specific things that I think governments can do. Um, and I'll talk about three areas. The first is on proactive disclosure. And I think you've already heard this from some of the speakers. Uh, obviously, governments should give 
very regular, at least daily updates. Um, others, uh, including IDFI that you just mentioned, uh, have published lists of what they feel should be included uh, on this practice. I won't spend time uh, on that, but obviously we need a lot of information uh, updated uh, regularly. Um, I think better practice at this time is to is for leading politicians, especially health officials and senior politicians, to give daily briefings. Um, and interestingly, uh, in much of Canada, we have seen a massive drop in the number of requests because uh, journalists, at least, have direct access to the top political leaders every day, and they can ask them anything at all. Uh, so they've kind of moved to that direct exchange of information as opposed to requests. So we sort of interesting in that. Um, and I think uh, the third point here. Um, is that uh, now access to information really can be a matter of life and death. We sort of, you know, we make that comment sometimes a little bit glibly, but really today that is true. Uh, and so uh, we need uh, governments to uh, explore ways to sort of the last mile in terms of getting information out there uh, to make sure that everyone is getting the information uh, uh, and especially uh, the most vulnerable uh, people. Um, and uh, hopefully new uh, solutions can be uh, found for that. And then after this crisis is over, uh, those uh, sort of last mile systems will still be used to get information out. So I think that could be a, a bump up for RTI from this. Secondly, uh, when it comes to reactive disclosure, um, our position has been that there should be no general measures of restriction. Uh, we understand that governments uh, have some constraints at this time, but uh, we don't believe in general measures. So, for example, uh, it would be legitimate, uh, we, we don't think it's legitimate to have a general extension of time limits. Rather, there could be a facility where justified for public bodies to extend time limits. But each extension should be justified. Uh, we cannot, you know, we've seen lots and lots of countries saying, oh, the time limits are suspended or the time limits are, are elongated. Uh, we don't believe that's legitimate. We believe that the principle of RTI remains uh, in place and that each extension would need to be justified. Lots and lots of government departments are not slammed at this time, while some are. Uh, so if you're slammed and you can't you know, focus on that. Um, then I think it, in terms of positive measures for COVID related requests, um, uh, I think that that kind of information, so, and I'm gonna enter a little bit into the debate that the last panel had about sort of some special measures and special groups. Uh, and I think that uh, not to detract from the existing standards, but to put in place better standards, faster, more comprehensive uh, responses for COVID related information. So faster and definitely prioritizing uh, journalists and civil society groups, groups that will directly use that information, especially to serve accountability purposes because our accountability systems are down while our need for accountability is up. Uh, so we need those, those uh, you know, RTI to be filling in a little bit on that. Um, uh, any legal changes should be as short term as possible uh, where you have a law. So it's difficult to pass laws at any time. And it's especially difficult now. So where you have a law authorizing some changes, we believe that the specific RTI changes should be in regulations that could be updated every couple of weeks. So the law may authorize RTI changes, but they should take place via regulation, which can be done every two weeks. We're seeing this thing move very quickly. We're seeing countries starting, some countries starting to come out of it, and any restrictions should come out at least as fast as that. And then lastly on that, it's very, very important uh, to keep the oversight bodies going. We've seen oversight bodies in some countries are just closing down. Uh, Eduardo, of course, represents the Argentine uh, oversight body. He's still going to work. Uh, those bodies need to keep going because if we get re re refusals, we need to be able to challenge those. Um, and then thirdly, in the digital space, and here's where I really see uh, benefits across the board, potentially from, uh, uh, um, from COVID, we are um, upping our digital uh, fluency and also just our digital systems. Um, so hopefully we will see uh, public bodies taking advantage of that uh, to move forward in terms of the digital processing of requests. Um, and uh, getting more bodies using digital systems, uh, getting you know, more facility in, in releasing information in digital formats. Um, we have a, a slightly bizarre situation here in Canada that when they send you electronic information, they, they often put it on a, a CD-ROM, uh, which, I mean, in my organization, no one has a computer that can read a CD-ROM. We have to have external drives for that. And so that's how out of date that kind of thing is. Uh, you know, maybe we could move forward a little bit um, on that. Um, and then uh, my final point on, on the digital sort of 
somewhat fitting into the digital thing is that uh, and, and Anna Maria also mentioned that you know the record keeping is 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 suffering a little bit. Um, we, we are seeing an enormous number of decisions being made in new ways, often by webinar rather than by meetings, and the paper trail is not as strong as it was before. I understand that because the decisions need to be made quickly um, and people aren't in the office and whatever, uh, but we certainly need those things to be recorded. So, I mean, we're recording this webinar. Uh, governments should certainly be recording their, their webinars, and that should be a, a forming part of the digital space. I will, if you permit me, just make one final comment in response to Marius's uh, point, um, and I won't enter into the debate about uh, standards, although uh, my view is that there, there's a lot to be done to improve international standards, but uh, I would note that international organizations are one of the real weak spots globally on access to information. Uh, national laws have been getting stronger and stronger, and of course not every country has a strong law, but anyway, there has been, I think, strong progress in improving those. Um, but intergovernmental organizations still, by and large, have very weak policies. Um, and I, not to not to kind of throw brick bats, but UNESCO, which is leading globally on this issue, has a particularly weak access to information policy of its own. Uh, so I think that we really need to see um, improvements on that. Uh, and I'll, I'll stop with that. Thank you very much indeed, Toby. So yes, we, we if to the extent that we've got standards, we need uh, leadership on implementing those standards, including from the intergovernmental organisations, um, and even in even in a country like Canada, which where I believe that there there is also a right of access to the internet, if I'm not wrong, um, uh, that you still have challenges with the way that digital is used. Um, and in response to what Philip was saying about we've uh, perhaps this crisis has created. How do you phrase it? You phrase it very nicely. It's COVID's created a technology enhanced world. Well, um, let, let's hope so. Let's, let's hope it helps us enhance the technologies that we have are using or should be using. Um, I've got one extra special guest speaker this evening uh, joining us uh, in his personal capacity, but someone who works on uh, the, the access to information systems at the European Union level, we have Fernando Florindo Gijón, who is uh, the, the, the Council of the European Union sent out a, uh, a notice a couple of weeks ago saying that they are continuing to process requests. I have to say that in Western Europe, that's quite exceptional because in many Western European countries, certainly in Spain and in France and in some others, the emergency legislation automatically suspended all uh, administrative timeframes and the right of access to information has been swept up in that. So it was it was a very nice positive piece of news to see that uh, at the European Union level things were still continuing to function. And I wonder, Fernando, if you could tell us briefly about that and, and how's it been going, how you're managing to do it, because I know you're all working from home. Over to you. Thank you. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Hello to all of you. Um, as, uh, as mentioned by Helen, I'm, I'm certainly talking of my experience uh, in the council, but at the same time, it is my views, not necessarily the position of the of the council. And, and, and three topics I wish to mention quickly or to share with you my, my reflections. I mean, probably the first, which some of you have already commented, it is this focus on information and that Certainly, the efforts now, at least in the council, uh, have clearly moved to providing more information in the sense of much more regular updates of the web page of the information, proactive information that is put in the web page, much more data, infographics, the reference to, to other web pages, and trying to develop all of this, which probably reflects, uh, in my opinion, a change also in the demand of the public, probably during the crisis. My, my personal experience is that surprisingly for the for the access to documents request they have remained more or less steady i mean it was uh, we expected an important decrease in the number of requests from citizens but it is not at all the case we are receiving more or less the same similar what has changed is we are receiving much more requests for information which in our legal framework that have a different status and go through a different procedure, but it is much more 
the public request and information in general, not explicitly access to documents. And particularly on COVID, on COVID has been a huge in increase, which shows a different tendency. And we try to, to adapt and try to provide all of this information proactively because there is clearly uh, a demand of the public. So it was my first, uh, my first experience. The second is, as, as Helen has mentioned, and we have certainly, uh, I mean, we started, I think it was on the 17th in, in March in, uh, with the quarantine in Belgium to work from uh, teleworking, working all of us from home. But we have managed to, uh, to, to, to respond more or less on reasonable, uh, similar deadlines that usually, and within our deadlines, and more or less no important delay, probably only I would mention two cases, but very peculiar, which is the uh, request for documents concerning classified documents that we have difficulties to, to, to access to them remotely, but it is probably the only case. And one of the other cases is decisions that have to be taken at the council level, I mean in the ministers, that it is true that the, the, the decision making in the council has a slow it a little, because of the of the crisis and so sometimes it takes a few days extra but it is no problem i i check it this morning and more or less after the, the quarantine more or less we have received around 300 requests for access to documents um approximately half have already been answered and probably and the others will will certainly be be soon so it is not not a big delay or we are not taking a delay in in answering to citizens and i imagine that the access without having figures i imagine the usual uh, percentage of documents released is, uh, has not changed it is more or less the same but the third comment i wish to mention is linked to this decision making of the council and at least and i don't know if it is purely because of the uh, intergovernmental uh, nature of the of the council of the european union or it is more general but certainly what has happened with the crisis and with all of the teleworking and the ways of working is that the working methods have changed. The decision making has really changed a lot in the, in the last. Um, Toby Mendel just mentioned the problem of the paper records that are reducing. And this is, this is clear that is happening. You have much more informal meetings, very, uh, much less formal meetings because people cannot travel, cannot come. We cannot convene meetings. So it is very, very complicated. So the way of working of the council has changed radically in a few times. And we are struggling to apply the transparency rules that were based on a different way of working and how to change it. I mean, just to mention, just for a practical issue, I mean, we, uh, one, part of the most important information were the minutes of the minute of the meetings, but there is no meeting. Uh, it was the, the voting records, but there is no vote because everything is decided by writing procedure. We have been obliged to immediately create, we keep on producing voting records, but which are, let's say, different because it, they do not correspond to a real vote. They correspond to what member states have notified in writing. But we prepare, uh, fish the vote, what we call in the, in the jargon, just to try. For the minutes, more or less the same. We are creating a sort of record to try to cope with this problem, to provide similar information adapted to a way. But it is not always easy and, and we are still, I mean, we are in this process of reflection, how to cope with a way of working which certainly has much less uh, paper record. Um, because probably it is temporary, I don't think this, is, this will last and it is probably which simply need to adapt. But certainly it is one of the most uh, important developments that we have to find uh, solutions and we are trying to do it. Thanks a lot and this was my reflections. Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed, Fernanda. That was very useful to hear that perspective and some of the sort of practical issues that you're facing. Generally, you can process requests, but not classified documents. I think that goes back to what Eduardo was saying about being reasonable. Um, there will be some difficulties that uh, you, you don't normally face. Um, the issue of record keeping is a really important one, and I'm glad, it, I'm glad it's being raised. There's been a little debate going on in the chat. Uh, Joe Powell uh, from the support unit had raised, um, is SB from the Open Government Partnership, had raised a question about uh, government procurement. Uh, Mukalani Dimba, I saw that, that you're citing a couple of uh, examples there. I haven't had time to read them to know exactly what they say. Um, uh, uh, we just put in, my colleague Rachel 
has just put in the chat a link to a document that we published, a, a set of 10 recommendations that Access Info, the Open Contracting Partnership and some other NGOs uh, published a couple of days ago in which we, amongst other things, look at the problem of the very rapid decision making that is taking place on procurement. Um, it's legitimate to have emergency procurement where you bypass the normal procedures, but the problem is the way it's being done by phone calls, by emails, by WhatsApps, by video conferences, et cetera, means that there's a huge risk of not having the paper trail. Um, whilst much of the procurement is being done in good faith, there are risks of corruption. And for those working on accountability afterwards, that, that could really create uh, difficulties. So the obligation to keep a record, which is a precondition for having access to information, documents and data, is something that I think that we need to emphasize at this point. We've only got a couple of minutes left in this block. I really wanted to pick up on one thing that Toby said, which I feel may be controversial. So I'd like to ask any of the speakers who've spoken thus far, including Ana Maria and Eduardo, uh, or the others to react to this, which is the idea that journalists and civil society should perhaps have their requests, if I understood you right, should have their requests um, fast-tracked. Um, which is something that we do try to resist recommending generally. So uh, I wonder if uh, and that all requesters should be treated equally. So I wonder if anyone would like to react to that. Eduardo, adelante. I'm sorry, I was muted. So I believe that it's related to what I already stated. I believe that even in this crisis, we cannot really discriminate any of these requests. So, I mean, maybe this could be request discriminated based on who is requesting it or not. This is just the mere exercise of a human right. And these human or fundamental rights I mean, I don't feel that there's any sort of legal provision in international law for us to be able to make this request discrimination. And on the other hand, Helen, you are telling us that journalists and the civil society, well, you're dividing them. So right now, I would like to wonder who is a journalist, someone who is maybe publishing in a newspaper, in a printed media, or maybe in a blog that has a lot of readers. I mean, who is a civil society as well? someone from the academia who requests information that is available at the Ministry of Health. I mean, I would like to be very emphatic in terms of the fact that requests cannot be discriminated. And there's another conceptual matter here. We also stated that requests could be made anonymously. So we would be violating these principles if right now we start asking, okay, if this request is going to be prioritized prior, prioritized in this or this other way based on the role that this person plays in the society. I think that it is very dangerous. We would not respect this fundamental principles of non-discrimination and also anonymous requests. Thank you, Eduardo. Ana Maria, Ana Maria, would you like to comment on this? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I share Eduardo's concern uh, about uh, equality and anti-discrimination of the requesters. But here, I mean, uh, I would say that maybe we should think about two issues here. One is that in some countries, there are, uh, I mean, journalists have special, special uh, position, even in the constitutions or in laws, special laws such as laws of media, granting faster a uh, uh, faster procedure, this is one thing, and maybe different different procedure, not, not completely the same as it is for the regular requests. I agree with Eduardo that now the issue of who is the journalist is open. I mean, this is for a debate, so this is not that clear. Uh, but then I also suggested uh, uh, um, earlier that um, there is a, there is a, there could be additional, I mean, element uh, if the information is affecting a, a, a larger number of, of persons, a group, 
uh, especially if it's a vulnerable group or, or, or the community as a whole. I mean, all COVID related information is now uh, affecting everyone. So uh, this is something I will, uh, and also one thing in Aarhus Convention, there is a 48 hours uh, uh, deadline for the, uh, for the requests relating to environment. I mean, environment is everything that is living. So basically it could be also related to our health. So, I mean, this is something we could also think about. Okay, thanks very much for that. Yes, perhaps uh, some laws do have them. I think, uh, was it uh, Philip or someone who mentioned the 48 hour timeline for requests that are about um, life and uh, um, so that, that's something that's really important. Did I get it right, Philip? Yes, yes. Life and liberty. Yeah. Life on. and liberty. That's it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Toby, do you want to come back on that point since uh, right to reply? You need to unmute yourself. It's amazing how difficult it is to remember a simple thing like that. Uh, so just to respond to uh, Eduardo's points, um, I don't think there's any problem with the international legal framework on this. Uh, under international law, right to information is protected as part of right to freedom of expression. That right may be um, derogated from or changed during uh, emergencies. Uh, it, you're not allowed to discriminate during emergencies, but that discrimination would relate to discrimination on a prohibited ground, such as race, uh, religion, uh, gender, we're not proposing that kind of discrimination. So the term discrimination uh, covers a lot of ills and that, that's, that it's not that kind of discrimination. So I think it's perfectly uh, legal. Um, we would uh, also, I would have to strongly disagree about the anonymous requests. Uh, no one needs to, I, 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 I never said that requests should be suspended apart from those ones. I'm just talking about special fast, the, the 48 hour kind of idea. Uh, uh, you can still make your anonymous request and go through the regular route if you don't want to expose yourself or to try to take benefit of that expedited uh, request. Um, <clears throat> when it comes to journalists, and I mean, we're, we're you know, uh, I, I said journalists in civil society, first of all, but actually uh, any uh, justification for special rights, freedom of expression of any sort, rights for journalists, in my opinion, can only be justified through the role that journalists play in carrying information to the public. So it's, although the journalist appears to be the beneficiary of the right, the right actually vests in the public as recipients of information. Under international law, the right to freedom of expression protects both receiving and imparting information. And we have, for example, protection of sources. We especially protect journalists' rights uh, to not disclose their sources, even in front of a court of law, uh, because we need the source to talk to the public through the journalist, not because the journalist has some special rights. And it's exactly uh, the same idea that is in play here. Um, and I think that, it, the, I mean, Anna Maria mentioned, you know, about the, the sort of public interest. I mean, I think what justifies all of this uh, is the public interest. And, and final point or two, two final points, I, I'm not only uh, suggesting that we uh, bias or privilege uh, certain requesters, I'm also suggesting that we privilege certain types of requests. Uh, so it's I'm, I'm calling for two uh, deviations from our normal flat earth approach to, to things. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and I forgot the other point I was going to make. It's I think we're going to have to really keep moving. Eduardo wants to come in. I'd ask you to be very, very brief, Eduardo, because I do have to move on to the next block. Yeah, no, um, it's just to respond, just to respond very, very briefly. I think that Toby is totally wrong, not partially wrong, in terms of international standards. And I will just read Article 1 of the American Convention of Human Rights that is similar to the European Convention, to the, I, the, to the, the Covenant, the ICCPR, and so State party to this convention undertake to respect the rights and freedoms, rights and freedoms recognized herein, and to ensure to all persons subject to their jurisdictions the free and full exercise of those rights and freedoms without any discrimination for reasons of race, color, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, economic status, birth, or any other social conditions, period. Toby, I'm sorry, you're wrong. None of those, <laughs> none of, none of those 
uh, relate to the profession of journalism, first of all. Secondly, uh, we are not taking away anybody's right. We're simply expediting. And as I said, we're doing it for the whole public. Okay, I'm going to have to stop this now because we've got to get on to the last section where we'll also have a bit more of a focus on open data. But we've clearly touched on something very important. It's come up in other conversations in the last few weeks. Um, we had quite a, a hot discussion about it while we were preparing the 10 recommendations on emergency procurement. And we came to some kind of compromise where we said that, um, it, in fact, if journalists ask questions, for example, at press conferences, and get answered that any data that they're provided with should immediately be put online for everyone to benefit from. So we were trying to find compromises where journalists do have their special forums for asking for information, um, but making sure that everyone else has the right to that. This is the reverse that we're talking here. I, I, I'm serious, I will propose that we set up another discussion uh, to, to thrash this one out because I do think it's important and it's an example of where perhaps this crisis is throwing up um, particular points that different communities need to discuss and, and look at their position on. So that, that will be a very interesting discussion going forward. I also saw that Andrew Eccleston in New Zealand, um, hi Andrew, put a, a comment on this in the, in the chat box um, about, you know, does that mean other the commissioners should prioritize these as well, speed up requests from journalists or civil society. How does that, what are the consequences of that kind of proposal? So let's, uh, let's make a note to discuss that. And without further ado, I'm going to move on to our third uh, and final block before we have the, then the closing remarks from uh, Ania from the Open Data Charter. So we have two speakers in uh, our third block. And, that, and it's entitled Lessons Learned and Calls for Long-Term Change. And I'm happy to turn first to, uh, good morning again, Paul, uh, to Paul Stone from Stats New Zealand uh, to, to talk about your perspectives on that. Thank you, Paul. Hi, everybody. Um, so I've got a, a couple of lessons learned, I guess, and it's building on what people have said already. So picking up on open by default uh, and participation. Um, and what I think the lesson that we've learned, certainly here in New Zealand and other countries, is that we are information by default rather than data by default. Um, and that is linked to uh, how people respond in a crisis. So what we've also learned is that people want to help. People want to find ways to help because that helps them cope with the crisis as well. And there are a lot of people out there, we've underestimated how many people look to data as a way of helping. Um, so we wanted to see, um, what I can do is actually share on screen uh, some examples. Okay, so this website is, is a great website. It's great information um, and we are, it's being updated daily and New Zealand has a good, uh, picture of what is going on, um, detailed information, and it, but it took some time and some negotiation to get the ability to download the data because people wanted to take that data and to communicate it in a different way. Sorry, here's another example of, get to the top of my, sorry. Get out of, So, um, sorry, I'm just getting, because the things are in the way of me getting to the tabs. Um, so this is a treasury giving economic information and that has um, also been released in PDF. And so people are screaming out for the data and the people looking to get to the data are building dashboards. And the reason they want to do this is they want to communicate to people in a different way uh, the information that they're getting. Um, here's another example. So the main reason, two, two reasons that people are wanting the data about what's going on. 
is to be able to communicate to others in a different way to, to help more people understand what's going on. And the other reason they want data is to be able to um, help in the response, to help others to cope with the situation of lockdown. Um, and, and in that light, we've had data that's not, been, not about the, what's going on now, but it's the open data that should be open before we hit the crisis. And it's what we've learned is that things don't change once you're in a crisis. You're not going to get new systems and processes. You're going to have to deal with what is accessible at the time of crisis. And so this is an example where people have taken census data and job market data and broken it down by like gender or ethnicity and different demographics to look at the impact of isolation on people and their jobs um, and who's, who are going to be the most vulnerable communities during lockdown, for example. Another example of using data that's already open to be able to help people is Wellington City Council created a map of where all the uh, support services are located that you can access for mental health and other social services, shelters and so forth as well as things like pharmacies and supermarkets and police stations. Um, and then, whoops, building on that is the, uh, oh, is the, um, the idea of actually, while we're in a crisis for a pandemic, it's gonna go on for some time and there could be other hazards that happen. So uh, Landcare Research have done a, um, some work on taking census data and looking for vulnerable populations for pandemic and then overlaying that with uh, areas that are vulnerable to flood as we're a country now in uh, lockdown and, and moving into winter. So I'll stop sharing now and um, just those examples really are highlighting that um, don't underestimate how much the people want to be involved and, and help through data but also how important it is to be more data pre prepared for the next time, uh, because we, we want to, um, people want to be able to respond and, and help people and rely on data being open before the event happens, because it's certainly not gonna come out uh, during the event. And that's that all I'll share for now, yes. Thank you very much indeed, Paul. I was just thinking while you're talking that you are talking to us from tomorrow uh, <laughs> because it's, it's already the 7th of May in New Zealand, if I'm not wrong. And I'm watching everything you've got set up. It really did feel like you're talking to us from tomorrow. Um, so that, that was wonderful. Um, the point about... Uh, it will be the, in, in, in a moment of crisis, it's the systems that you already got in place that you're going to be using is uh, terribly important. Mm -hmm. um, it's also really interesting to see the level of disaggregation of the data. This is a point that uh, we always drive home that the Open Data Charter, of which I'm also privileged to be on the board of, um, is, is, is always stressing that we need to have data that's disaggregated. And to see that you've got that and then are able to use that data in your response to the, this particular crisis uh, is very interesting. And it's a very important lesson learned, I think. And also echoing what Philip was talking about, the readiness of people to get involved and to use the data um, in ways that will help them help their communities. I don't know if you want to just comment on my reflections there. <laughs> Yeah, I oh, know that, that's, that's absolutely right. Um, so, I mean, I, th I think this cr current crisis is an opportunity to learn that we need to be better prepared in terms of data and to, we need to start now opening data for next time. <laughs> um, unfortunately, there probably will be a next time, but uh, it, it just, you know, whether it's a, a pandemic or any other kind of crisis, um, we need to have the fundamental data about our population open. Um, so statistics are really important. Uh, but also, as we saw in that last example from Landcare, there are other, uh, what, other things that can happen, not just the crisis you're in, but things can compound. Um, and so the more we know about 
our land and our infrastructure um, is really important as well. And it needs to be accessible to anybody at the you know, click of the fingers. Perfect, thank you very much indeed. We're being asked in the, uh, in the chat if we can have a link to what you presented. We will make sure that everything that's been presented, uh, all the links, are available in the what we what we gather the material we gather after about this webinar afterwards, and we are being recorded, so it will be okay. available to people to rewatch if you miss something. Right. Um, there's I've a bit just, of a def. Uh, the, the, I've just yeah. posted in the chat a uh, link to a document. It's posted got links, it. Fantastic. Links yeah. In real time. Thank you very much indeed, Paul. Um, uh, there's a bit of a discussion going on in the chat as well about definitions. I won't go into it now, but clearly. The whole question of definitions and how we count in order to make any kind of data comparable cross country uh, is very important, as is the way that data is stored so that it's interoperable. Um, let's go to our last actual speaker, which is Agustin, Agustin uh, Frisera from Democracia en Red, uh, also in Buenos Aires. Uh, over to you, Agustin. Thank you. Gracias. Thanks, Helen. I'm, I'm going to speak in Spanish. So if you need to switch, I'm going to give you a couple of seconds. I would like to thank you, everyone, first and foremost, for having me here. I know that you're in, you have invited a lot of very important, distinguished guests, and I am included here. So thank you so much for thinking of me. So I am going to have a very short intervention. Perhaps it is going to be a little bit more general in terms of everything that I've heard. I'm going to be addressing not only what's going on in Argentina, also some things that are going on in the region. And of course, this background, this context, just, just pushed us to start doing things from one day to the other, just without any preparation whatsoever. I believe that our legal frameworks are not prepared to address this type of circumstances, as Paul was mentioning, and any other types of crisis that could entail other consequences like this one. It is a little bit difficult to talk about lessons learned. However, there are certain matters that are quite obvious right now without internet, which is our main means of communications towards the outer world in this lockdown situation. Well, we also need to consider and believe that internet is a human fundamental right. The UN has addressed this. Some countries agreed, some others we're opposing to this. However, there is a rare solution in this matter. We still need to, of course, consider this internet as a public utility that is fundamental because it enables this type of discussions. Moreover, we could say, for instance, in Argentina, we have about 90% access to internet. It all depends more on age more than the social strata. But of course, we are using data and that data entails a cost. We need to pay for this data. So we need to have, let's say, open, free internet spaces for us to be able to Google or for us to be able to have this seller rating that is used by internet careers, not to charge the end user for using certain apps. So this would entail, for instance, rediscussing how neutral, not neutrally a network is, for instance. That's the type of options and solutions that we, we could have available. I believe that if our life is going on online through a screen, then we need to put a lot of effort in terms of educational tools so that we can really face all of this type of situations, such as, let's say, fake news, voting, and some situations like this one that are life or death topics. So how can we really make sure that the media and the means of communication, all of them can just continue to develop this type of skills, such as prioritizing sources of information, evaluating the significance of statistics. As Paul was just mentioning, we need to be able to learn how to read all of these stats. We need to be prepared in the region for us to be able to interpret these stats and to identify whether there's a fake set of data or fake piece of information or pieces of news. There is a lot of evidence that confirms that whenever there are 
persons who get to identify this fake news, then they are able to warn others so that they can prevent this dissemination of this fake information. So well, in France, Finland and other states in the European Union and other states all over the US have adopted methods to identify this fake news. Well, we know that it's not a matter of being young or the youth. We know that we see a lot of preconceptions and those who share these pieces of information of these pieces of news, fake news, the so-called fake news or these toxic messages are the elderly over 65 year olds. And that has been confirmed from a lot of evidence all over the countries. It doesn't have to do with the level of education. It has to do more with a set of skills, specifically the digital world. We also need to start also developing skills across our own state so that we can generate this type of online meetings. I am part of an organization where we do have this type of virtual meetings, so we are already prone to using this software. We even study and get educated on how to use this software. We know that life online is not the same that offline life. Uh, we know that we have different types of dynamics. We could never replace the you know, real life with online life because each has certain advantages. So right now, well, in our entity, well, we know that we are really very familiar with software. But anyway, we're not happy. But I mean, right now we're not happier. We're just more productive. And that's because we tested a lot of tools for a long, long time. So these skills have been built for a long time. We're now really using these skills. We're putting them in practice. And also this process of co-creation in this digital arena, uh, specifically in this digital arena, I can tell you that we are still developing all of these skills. But of course, sometimes it is better to start discussing everything in writing. So, so for a matter of productivity, it is perhaps very beneficial. Again, well, I wanted to tell you a side note. Well, we had a session, we had 35,000 individuals attending. We would have had to just book a whole football, football field for us to be able to have all of these people attending and spend a lot of time in terms of sound matters and audio, audio visuals. And we were able to do all of this with $14 just to put all of these numbers right and um, everything. I mean, all of this is taken into consideration when deciding whether to go for one software or another different software or in Argentina, for instance, to face this outbreak since people were saying that since no software was bought, then the judges needed to set up their own previous like 10 year old software and operating system so that they could really run very, very old software that they had. So I think that software investments are key as part of the state budget. So that's well, that's all I had to say. I have one last comment. I was telling you that again, we need to continue learning because overall what we have noticed is that we are putting everything into this framework of this outbreak of COVID before COVID and during COVID. So we need to start trusting. Please trust in me. I think that it is important that we can just continue supplementing our citizen engagement, specifically with all of this online tools. I think that all of this is possible. And also for us to be able to really, well, Again, like I told you, we had a whole Congress organized with $14 with 35,000 attendees. So all of these type of circumstances are possible. So we may have a less intensity, but again, we're going to have core key points of, well, points of view right now. We need to continue exchanging idea. And just to summarize my participation, we need to find a way to make everything fit together, all of the pieces. Again, the advantages of this online life and the real life outside internet. And again, this life through a screen has got a lot of room for improvement. But first we need to learn a little bit more about how to use it. 
and how to get more skills. And secondly, I think that it is going to be quite enriching to all of us. And again, my third point is that it is convenient to all of us. And just to address these considerations that Eduardo mentioned and whether regarding the fact of what is the concept of a journalist or the civil society. I think that our areas of knowledge in general need to change this point of view, this mindset. So let's just take advantage of this con context just for us to be able to analyze all of these different standpoints. Right now I am at home, I uh, am trained in urbanism, so I know that there's a line that divides public space from the private space. I mean, categories are not going to change because public matters remain as such and private matters remain as such. However, the questions that may be raised in one domain or other change. Where am I? If I am being streamed over YouTube, am I at home? Is it my private arena or am I in this public arena, in a digital arena at the same time? That is just my question. Thank you so much, Agustin. Thank you very much indeed. Some really interesting reflections there. Very impressive that you managed to get 35,000 people to an event. Um, it's true that perhaps this crisis is making us see the possibilities, having discussions like this. It's what Anna Maria mentioned earlier about the level of cooperation that's taking place right now. Um, and I think that one of the things we wanted to come out of this uh, webinar are recommendations for the Open Government Partnership and the idea that governments could significantly scale up their co-creation processes is a really interesting and important one. Also, given how we're all so heavily dependent on the internet, um, the protection of a right of access to the internet and of net neutrality is clearly something that we should all be working on after this call. Uh, and your point about data literacy, um, data literacy, media literacy, um, it's, it's, it's uh, something to include in educational agendas where it hasn't yet been done for sure. So thank you very much for those reflections. We are super short of time. I'm going to let us run over 10, 12 minutes more so that we can have our wrap up reflex reflections from Ania. Um, we, so just to let all the people, we've had about 180 to 200 people who've come into the, come in and listen during the course of this call. So not 35,000, but we've had a good number. Um, uh, if you have to go, I totally understand. It's, if it's morning or evening or lunchtime, breakfast, drinks time, whatever it is for you. If you can stay for a, give, bear with us for another few minutes, uh, that would be excellent. Also just to repeat, uh, that we will gather all the comments and reflections that have been made in the chat and share them with our uh, excellent group of speakers in order that we can perhaps have some more responses to people who had reflections or questions that weren't addressed or answered. Um, uh, and I think that uh, with that, I will pass to Anya. Uh, if you can, just give us some thoughts or reflections uh, Anya, uh, Director of the Open Data Charter, on uh, calling, calling in from London, on what you've uh, heard. Anya, over to you. Thank you, Helen. And I think you, you've made my um, closing remarks uh, much simpler with your seamless moderation and uh, conclusions there. I, I um, will be very brief because I know we're, we're over time, uh, but it was interesting to hear how there's some um, a good degree of consensus across the uh, types of challenges that we're, we're facing um, in an unprecedented time uh, in terms of uh, the demand for information and data. Uh, not necessarily, perhaps, I thought it was interesting in seeing a spike in numbers of access to information, but in people wanting to be informed, people understanding what is happening. Um, and I think there was uh, excellent points there of um, how good communication, um, working with what you have, these daily briefings that are happening, having a journalist be, uh, being the chance to come in, um, and then some, some really concrete uh, suggestions there or, or innovations on publishing a lot of that information documents uh, straight after the 
the sessions, uh, including in open formats, uh, as a way to, to help more people understand what is going on, giving uh, the possibility to, um, uh, in in open data community, it's called. Uh, we want data to be machine readable, but also uh, we want people to, to be uh, accessible to people, um, uh, human readable, <laughs> perhaps. So I think there's an important point here about uh, establishing those good communications channels sort of going back to to basics um we also had some uh very heated debates um i think in terms of how to work with prioritizing uh data being published or or expediting some of the the requests and and there were some interesting uh solutions also in the chat which i in, ended up uh uh, losing track of because there was just uh, it seems like a parallel uh, panel going on in in our chat room um, but about and I think this brings the nexus of access to information and, and open data Helen which you were talking about in the beginning uh, really front and center perhaps a very simple idea of publishing anonymized requests um, as open data and, and maybe identifying those that are most common, uh, should those be uh, expedited, uh, we would have to turn that back uh, to Eduardo to see if that it, it re goes back to the discrimination um, issue. Uh, but there's also, uh, in terms of lessons for, for lasting change, um, I thought uh, some very thoughtful points here on uh, taking uh, the actions and the um, the challenges that we're currently facing into opportunities, sort of making uh, lemonade with lemons uh, type of mindset of while we are uh, have the, the um, appetite for collaboration and the collective action that's needed to address the, this calamity, uh, how can governments, in, in inclus in, including a, uh, I, I would say even this is more relevant in places where there's uh, important legacies of mistrust in government. How can we take that into opportunities to increase transparency, increase collaboration, and um, increase trust um, in uh, the citizens and people to to public institutions? At the time, uh, well. Um, you're building and investing in what you have, building capabilities, data literacy. Uh, what does it mean to be data ready? Uh, how can we uh, be better prepared in terms of um, our data infrastructures for, for the next time or an, a future crisis? Um, there's, uh, there was a, a very important point there made by Paul as well on, on what is that fundamental data or the building blocks of, of a data infrastructure fit for, for crisis that we should be thinking about more in the long term. Um, and uh, a, a very important point in terms in the chat made as we're thinking about uh, gathering uh, and sharing this data, ensuring that they're addressing the needs of, of diverse citizens, uh, especially women and gender groups and, and those um, uh, groups that are going to uh, most likely be hit the worst. So I think that there uh, is a, a, a need to uh, increase in the same regards as we, we don't want to roll things back. We want to maintain uh, the same level or improve levels of transparency. We also want that to be done in ways that uh, consider uh, a diversity of different needs. Um, and finally, just to wrap up, um, there's I think we, we left this perhaps for another discussion, but whether there's the need to revise our current uh, existing norms, um, information frameworks, are they fit for uh, facing these types of challenges? And, and I wonder if we can think about uh, designing these uh, norms to be more adaptive, to consider context and, and the different types of uh, problems or, or uh, applications that could be that we could face and then help us think more specifically about where are the, the potential gaps that we might have within uh, those frameworks. Thank you, Helen. Thank you very much indeed for that, uh, Anya, for it was an excellent overview of some of the points that have been thrown up. Um, clearly there's a lot of food for thought here. 
there are things that we need to carry on reflecting on. Um, Anna Maria, you also put in the chat about the privacy debate. We slightly steered away from that because otherwise we just don't have, in an hour and a half, we don't have time. Um, in order to structure for our own benefit, for all the work that many of the people on this call, we've got a lot of people who professionally work on the right of access to information on this call. Um, uh, so for all of us, uh, as well as for making recommendations to the Open Government Partnership, we will look in to see whether we can actually continue perhaps a series of structured discussions uh, in order to take some of these reflections forward, whilst at the same time doing some more background work in gathering, uh, compiling the best practices, which we've already been trying to do, the problems and the best practices in order to be really well informed for our, for our future debates. Um, so that's one thing that I would commit to do. There were other things that we didn't manage to talk about, comments I saw passing about different levels of government and how you can have very good data at the central government level, for example, but very poor data um, when it, you come down to a more regional or local level. Uh, how do we address that? How does uh, data, um, how does information get to certain uh, more vulnerable sectors of society and groups? Because whilst we're talking about the internet and the access to the internet or Agnostine's points, at the same time, uh, not everyone yet has that, that level of access. So the, the need to address something like that. In fact, Agustin, you said something which sounded like you were making a reference to the famous, I think it's a famous Benedetti, Maria Benedetti quote, which is um, just when I just when I had all the answers, they changed the questions, um, if I got it right. Um, and maybe there's a little bit of that going on as well. We thought we, we knew the path that we were on and suddenly a whole lot of, of new challenges have been thrown up. Um, but as many of you, and thank you all to, for the, the speakers um, for contributing, really uh, some really excellent perspectives and reflections. Um, and I like the way that you all managed to address, identify the challenges, but also to point to what could be potential opportunities going forward. Um, so I think that on um, that note, uh, we're going to have unfortunately to stop. Um, but I, I really thank you once again to, to everyone, to uh, Ana Maria and Eduardo, to Philip, to Toby, to Fernando, Paul, Agustin, and Ania. Thanks again to Bianca and Megan for organizing this. Thanks again. They're a bit, I can't see them like in a normal conference, but we, I know we have interpreters somewhere in the, in the depths of the system here as well. So thank you very much uh, as ever and uh, hope that we can continue this conversation and hope to see you all again either like this virtually or possibly when we can hug each other again for some people in person as well. Um, stay well, stay safe and thank you very much. Goodbye.